We've been to all four corners of Britain in our quest to interview the great and good of entertainment. Comics, actors, writers, politicians, singers, dancers and choreographers. It doesn't matter who they are. They've all given me their own take on the world they live in and have, in their own way, helped to define what makes Britain great. So join me and my assistants as we get another insight into the marvellous and enigmatic world of showbiz here on Beyond the Title. Actor, singer and entertainer Danny John Jules shot to fame in 1988 when he was cast as Cat, a.k.a. Dwayne Dibley, in the cult sci-fi sitcom Red Dwarf. For over a decade, the eponymous mining spaceship reigned supreme on BBC Two, toying with the very foundations of sitcom before its climax in 1999. After Red Dwarf, Danny swapped space for the Caribbean island of San Marie in the popular comedy drama Death in Paradise, followed by gracing the floor on the heavyweight Strictly Come Dancing in 2018. I caught up with the star of stage and screen to talk felines, sequins, and his thoughts on a formidable career in comedy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Danny John Jules. An interesting thing about you is that you were actually a dancer in a group called Second Generation, appearing on light entertainment shows of the 1970s and choreographed by legendary choreographer Dougie Squires. What sort, of yeah. grounding, what sort of grounding was that, and what did it teach you about the workings of entertainment? Well, uh, Dougie Squires, like myself, was uh, you know, a working class lad who um, worked at the, uh, in a sausage factory. And um, he, he, he you know, worked his way up to um, you know, one of the country's leading uh, directors and choreographers, and um, uh, when 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 I auditioned for that group, I was pretty much, you know, the, the same, you know, working class kid who went to a little drama group in a church hall, and then I went for an audition, and I I got the job, and then and then I was, um, I've never done another job since, it's, except entertainment. And the grounding of that is that the first thing I saw was, well, you know, if he can do it. I can do it, you know. So, um, you know, Dougie Squires put many, many a, a, a performer on, on, on the road to a career in show business, and I was lucky to enough to have landed at his door, as they say. But the grounding was very good because, you know, um, uh, you, 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 you worked hard, you know, and um, it, it pays off, I suppose. That's, that's my only outlook on it. What did you make of the TV landscape in the 70s? Because it was very different compared to that of the 80s. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, the, the thing about variety is is in the word itself. Even in the 70s, you had, um, I mean, you had black performers all over the television in the 70s. Uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> there was there was black people on telly when it was still black and white. Um, you know, you had Charlie Williams, the um, the comedian. He was an ex-footballer. Um, um, you had Kenny Lynch with Jimmy Tarbuck. You you had um, Rudolph Walker. You know, there was. There, in fact, you had you had, you had people. You know that had had. Um, you know, they were unsure. well. Sammy Davis Jr. was the first. You know, person I kind of recognised from the Palladium Sunday night at the Palladium with, um, you know, Bruce Forsyth and 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 uh, uh, and those kind of characters. Variety has always had a variety of performers. I mean, <laughs> variety is the perfect word for, um, you know, show business because the the true um, variety performers were. Uh, you know, their their main bread and butter was not the television, was was the actual touring and the shows and, you know, uh, people like Morecambe and Wise and Tommy Cooper and all these people. Tommy Cooper started in, in when he was in the army. Um, so did Norman Wisdom. Norman Wisdom started when he was in the army. He was another working class lad. He, me and Norman Wisdom were born in the same hospital. And then I worked with him in the 70s. Um, uh, you know, so variety was very much um, a working class um, industry. If you look at the backgrounds of all the, 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 um, uh, the variety artists, 
they came from all over the country, you know, and, um, you know, uh, most of them, you know, of the, of the ones that we know, uh, uh, most of them were from, were from up, up north, mostly. Um, you know, the working men's clubs, these were where the, these people applied their trade in front of the toughest audiences in the world, you know. And so, you, you know, by the time they got to television, they were so experienced that they could handle anything. And that's why, if you look at the, 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 the people that had 20 million, 30 million viewers like Morecambe and Wise and these, they were all variety artists who applied their trade around, you know, the seaside resorts and the working men's clubs. And, you know, so they'd already done their, uh, you know, they've already put their work in. They, they, they've worn the T-shirt by the time they got to television. Um, hence, uh, you know, they had the, um, uh, hence they had the, um, the experience to deal with the television. And so, you know, a lot of those acts, before they were double acts, they were individual performers on the circuit, you know, and they were put together by very clever promoters who, who could um, see, you know, uh, a good team when they, they saw one. Um, you know, that goes right back to Laurel and Hardy. You know, one was American and one was English. Um, you know, so you, you'd see how either they were in groups and then they became solo artists or they were solo artists who, who you know, who became double acts. And, um, you know, and, and, and that's where you'll find the big stars, you know, they all came out of variety. Whereas um, compared to today, you can make one television appearance and no one's never heard of you and you can become a star. Yeah. yeah, excellent. So uh, the next question, uh, you covered it a little bit just a moment ago, but uh, yep. names such as Kenny Lynch, Charlie Williams, Rudolph Walker, and then later people such as yourself and Lenny Henry helped to pave the way for multiculturalism in entertainment. How important were these figures, along with yourself, bringing about the significant social change? Well, uh, it's funny because, you know, if you... If you, again, if you take someone like Lenny Henry, he was just a, a kid who went to a, you know, he went to an audition. He was, you know, he he presented himself as a performer, and um, I don't think that, you know, when Lenny Henry went on New Faces and uh, and did uh, his when Lenny Henry was first ever seen and he was on television, they didn't know he was black. His first gag had, was his back to the audience. And he did an impression of Frank Spencer, i.e. Michael Crawford. And he did his first joke with his back to the audience. The audience laughed and he turned around and he was black. So that proved that the color didn't have anything to do with it. Not for Lenny Henry anyway, because when he, he his first joke they didn't know what colour he was. They laughed because it was funny. And, you know, because when, when he said, mm, Betty, and he turned around and he was black, I mean, the, the game was over, the, the show was over. He'd won with a clear, his first gag won and they hadn't even seen his face. And so that, you know, entertainment is something that, you know, everybody craves, you know, they want to be entertained and um, if given the opportunity to be funny and, um, you know, and people laugh, you know, that just means that you're good and um, they'll come and see you. But, you know, the, 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 the only yeah, hurdle yeah. is getting a chance to ply your trade in front of an audience and so, you know, I don't, I, I can't remember a time when there, there wasn't um, a variety of performers. I think, you know, when, if you go back and look at the, the background of most of the performers that we even know, you'll find that they'll, they'll either stem from immigrants of Jewish people. A vaudeville was, was awash with Jewish performers and, and black performers and, Puerto Ricans and Cubans and all kinds, you know, but, you know, people don't 
ask you to show your passport before you tell a, a story or a gag or sing a song. Um, you know, it's just a fallacy that, that the business wasn't multicultural before multicultural became a thing. Because Absolutely. okay, let, let's take let's take the Rat Pack for instance. They're revered all over the world, uh, you know, as the thing. Yet they were all immigrants. You know, they were all immigrants. They were, two of them were Italian. Um, one was an Englishman, a posh Englishman, and um, uh, and, and and Jewish, and. In fact, Sammy Davis Jr. was the only member of the Rat Pack whose parents were born in America. And he was the one who couldn't get into the clubs. But he was more American than all of them. Yeah, very so, true. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 that's, not, that's, not the, the sh that's not show business, that's society. You know, because, you know, uh, society unfortunately is incorporated into show business because it's just people and people make good decisions in their life or they make bad ones and i think that you have to run into the the, the good ones to be given that opportunity just like sammy davis most of the people that helped sammy davis were themselves immigrants you know irish bob hope irish mickey rooney irish you can go to Charlie Chaplin, English, Laurel, uh, Stan Laurel, English. I mean, you know, it was, it was, uh, otherwise the Americans would say, hey, what the hell are all these limeys doing in our business? You know, it, 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 where would you stop? You know, so what you're talking about is not the industry itself. It's just, you know, one club owner might be forward thinking and the next club owner might be living in the dark ages. Both will have a different response to that performer, and yeah, whether they yeah. whether they are accepted or not accepted, you know, and um, uh, and and that that rings that rings through, you know, society. It's not the business. It, it the the business is just, you know, uh, um, a, a, a genre or, um, you know, a profession. You know, it, it would be the same, you know, to, uh, in any profession, you know, society can uh, can have totally different outcomes depending on who you meet in your life, you know. Uh, well, we could take one modern example right now. Who, I mean, with Lewis Hamilton being the first Formula One driver of colour, who who diversified Formula One, if that's the case? Yeah, that's a very good point. It, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, who yeah. Was, was, did Formula One say, get, get me a black driver? No. Did, you know, did McLaren say that? No. The only reason Lewis Hamilton's there is because he's the fastest. Yeah, he's the best. That's the thing. He's the best. Yeah. And number two... That doesn't necessarily get you get you the seat in a in a in a in a twenty million pound car. You know, if you if you look at the background of all the other drivers, you'll be able to judge. You know, who had a bit easier route to that seat. But you know, um, Lewis Hamilton had to start with radio controlled cars. That's where he started. He went from radio controlled cars to go karts and on and on and on, you know. But no one mentions Ron Dennis. Ron Dennis, who, you know, was the head of McLaren at the time, I mean, he was the one that put his proverbials in the vice because, you know, one day he walked into McLaren and said, I'm going to spend 10 million quid to make this guy world champion. And I can imagine when they all looked and saw Lewis, they must have been going, what? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> went, you know, you know. So, did, well, you know, Ron Dennis needs a lot of, you know, he needs a lot of, of credit because just like Dougie Squires, 
you know, he was colorblind when he hired me. Is the same way that Ron Dennis was colorblind when he wanted the next world champion. If he was going to let society dictate how he re- reacts or acts, you know, it, it could have been another story. But, you know, Ron Dennis decided that he's going to be Ron Dennis and he's going to make his, his own decisions about, you know, what he sees as the future. And as we can all see, Ron Dennis was the one that was correct. You know, so, and because of that, um, you know, Mercedes are reaping the benefits just like McLaren were before. Yeah, absolutely. You know, spot on. They're, yeah. the ones reaping the benefits. They're, they're the ones reaping the benefits. Because if they can afford to pay Lewis Hamilton whatever he's getting paid, how much are they getting paid? Yeah. Yeah, very true. So you see what I mean? It's yeah. about who you meet. It's a, it's the people that you meet that 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 um, you know that inspire your life and 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 can change the the direction of your life. And and that's like Customato with Mike Tyson. You know, it was Customato that that corralled all that energy and that you know. Uh, to, to 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 make the world champion. I mean, how many people must have said, "Are you crazy? You let that guy live in your house?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. And then you know that's how you create world champions. You know, you take that raw talent, and somebody's got to try and corral it and and discipline it. And you know, the only place Mike Tyson was disciplined was when he was training in the ring, and, you know, that's where his discipline was. You know, his problem was when he came out of the ring. But Customato had, 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 had trained him and gave him that discipline that was going to make a world champion. Mike Tyson's problem happened when that mentor passed away and he was no longer there to, to pull on the reins. And he was the only one that... And Mike Tyson... You know, Customato was the only person that Mike Tyson respected to the point that he could keep him on the straight and narrow. Mike Tyson never got in trouble when he was with Customato. The moment Customato wasn't there anymore, his in, his influence, his mentor, his inspiration, his his surrogate father. You know, that's when his problems started. Again, it's about the mentors. Uh, that, you know. People have to put their, you know, you got to put, you got to put your, 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 you got to raise your head above the parapet, you know, when you're dealing with these characters, yeah. and and so you know, those are the people that need a lot, a lot of the the the, the um the praises for those people who, who who took that chance, you know, and then we we, we reap the benefits, you know, you know by right. seeing the great performances. Absolutely, yeah, that's it, isn't it? Um, okay, well, moving on to the next one. Uh, in 1988, you secured a career-defining role as the cat, a.k.a. Dwayne Dibley, in the cult sci-fi sitcom Red Dwarf. What were your, yeah. first, impres- what were your first impressions of the role? My first impression of the role was, wow, this is a, this is a crazy guy. He's talking to himself, you know. That's, that's, you know. That was the scene I did for my audition, you know, and um, I knew, I knew the guy. I knew, I knew the cat when I read it. I mean, he was show business. The cat is show business. You know, the cat is that variety performer. He is, he's, he's everybody. And, and the characters that I looked at, who he reminded me of when I read him were all very um, eccentric, outrageous performers in show business. I mean, the the influences that that roll into the cat are all the extravagant performers I thought about. If you look at, um, you'll, you'll see Jane Brown, you'll see Prince, you know, 
And, and if you look at those characters, you'll see eccentrics. You know? yeah. Rick, Rick James, Sammy Davis Jr. If you look at all those, those performers, you'll see him. Yeah. You know, as, as ever write up said about my performance, there's a, um, uh, and just that's what the cat is, he's a performer. I mean, Absolutely, hence, yeah. hence tongue, hence tongue tied. <laughs> tongue tied is the, the perfect example of the cat. Yeah. It can't yeah. dance. Who does a comedy in? This? You know, that harks back to Donald O'Connor, Jerry Lewis, Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You go back that tongue tied. They're doing funny songs. Okay. Um, so the next one is Sci-Fi notoriously spawns legions of hardcore fans. How have you coped with the avid nature in which the show is received? Uh, oh, I mean, again, really, um, anything that I saw as a chore or or anything out of the ordinary. I mean, all they're doing is showing appreciation. Um, I mean, that's what audiences do. They are the audience. I mean, if you, if people, you know, when a, when a performer bows to applause, he's not bowing for himself. He's, he's saying thank you to the audience. You know, um, and that's showing appreciation for the appreciation you're showing them. And that's what you do when, if someone comes up to you and, uh, you know, thank you very much that's really, you know, made my day see in this show or I love to do a performance. I mean, uh, it's only common decency and manners to, you know, say thank you and whatever. And, uh, uh, it's not really something that should be frowned upon. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this interview, would I? That's it, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's it in a nutshell. I wouldn't yeah. be doing this interview. Uh, I, I can't. I can't speak for other performers. I can only speak for myself. And uh, somehow, you, I'm here speaking to you guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, to what extent does the concept of space allow more creativity in terms of plot? Because it, the simple thing with space is that the audience can't immediately dismiss it. Um, because even what we know of space, i.e. the experts, the scientists, you know, what, what we know of space, the average person doesn't know what we already know, if you see what I mean. Mm. We, we all know... We all know there's a red dwarf out there, but do, does everyone know what a red dwarf is? You know, we know there's white holes. Do we know, you know, does the average person doesn't know. So when they're watching things like Star Trek, you know, some of it's fantastical and some of it's true. And like in Red Dwarf, you know, uh, some of the information is absolutely true. And, you know, as far as plot, to make up anything, you know, because, yes, we do, we know what's on Mars now, right? So when we look back at the old sci-fi um, shows that showed Mars, you know, with three-story Victorian houses on, we obviously know that's no longer relevant. And when you see them old shows now, you can look back and, and say, well, that's bullshit. But at the time, you didn't know it was bullshit. Because <laughs> nobody, cause nobody knew what was on Mars. So they could make up any old shit. Yeah, they're good. But now, yeah. but, but now we know what's there. You go and look back at half of them shows now, and they're void, aren't they? Because yeah. of the information that we have. Whereas Red Dwarf, we haven't got to that stage yet because, you know, we've been everywhere in space, and, you know, God knows what's true and what's not true. The only, the only thing is that whatever that plot is, the only reason that Red Dwarf's still going is because it's funny. Exactly. That's know, it. That's basically what it boils down to. And, you know, the fact that Doug Naylor is, is very good at, uh, you know, at, 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 um, at creating 
plots in those different worlds and, uh, you know, dimensions and all that stuff, you know, they've made it funny um, instead of taking it so seriously. I mean, if you look at Red Dwarf, you know, Lister had a, an Apple Watch in you know, Series 1. What do you think he was talking to Holly on? Yeah, that's very true, actually. Yeah, good point. <laughs> it's an Apple Watch. It's an Apple yeah. Watch. It's an Apple Watch. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's got a face on it. It's black. It's rectangular. It, it's, he's talking to his wrist with Holly's face on it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an Apple Watch. It wasn't called an Apple Watch. But it is an Apple Watch. If you look at it today, it's an Apple Watch. That was 31 years ago. Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> so if anyone was shouting bullshit at the time when Lister was looking at his watch, they're not saying bullshit today, are they? No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so again, that's one thing where Doug looked into the future and was right. So, you know, and it's funny. You could have made some money out of that. <laughs> you see what I mean? The same way, the same way, you know, the communicator on Star Trek was the Motorola flip phone. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it actually was. I can remember it now. I can picture it in my head. <laughs> right, right. So, but yeah. The only difference was it was called a communicator. Yeah, yeah. Did the same thing. So, same job. You know. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah. So that's all good. You know, let, let, hey, let's stay in space. It seems to be the only creative place to be. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Um, okay, so how did the character of the cat evolve over the 12 series? Um, the cat just got smarter. You know, that's pretty much what happened to his character over the years. But then again, if you look at it realistically, yeah, people used to say, how comes the cat's flying Starbug now? And so I said, well, hold on. He probably started flying Starbug after about, um, I think it was about seven years. Right? Yeah. Right. So that's how long it takes to train to be an airline pilot, seven years. Uh, you know? Yeah, good point. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, he can learn to fly Starbug in seven years. That's easy. If you can fly a jumbo jet in seven years, you can fly Starbug. You see what I mean? It's like, as you say, the word is evolved. I mean, he, he, you know, he, 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 was, he was a lot dumber when... It, when, when um, when Red Dwarf uh, first started, but as I said, you know, what else are you going to do, you know, 24 hours a day stuck on a spaceship except learn how to fly the bugger? Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's how I explain how he becomes evolved as far as the character is concerned because he's getting educated by the, by the week with all the different scenarios that happen around him and of course now he's been with, with he's been actually you know in, interacting with a human for the last seven years and and that human will be teaching him which is you know what Lister was first doing in the first place you know he was teaching him what crispies were uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. and and the cat had to remind him you know that he no longer eats off of the floor. <laughs> so yeah so yeah it's all about education is the key i think and um you know but it's how do you keep that puerility having evolved a bit you know smart and, and his gags have become more um his gags have become you know more uh, how would you say intellectual rather than you know and more self, more more self um, congratulatory, you know, um, 
they're always saying these are the best things since sliced bread and you know I think they've gone they've stuck more in that and he's also become more integral in the actual plot of the show sometimes whereas he was just the inverted commas the flash act you know yeah. the variety yeah. flash act came on yeah, he'd just pop yeah. up for a couple of minutes and that'll be it. Yeah. Yeah, the flat <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, why was the decision made to call it a day in 1999? Um, it wasn't called a day. I mean, that, the BBC decided that they didn't want to make Red Dwarf anymore, but that wasn't the decision by Red Dwarf. You know, that was a decision by the suits. You know, and obviously, as we could see, the suits yet again were wrong. Because, you know, they said that there was no longer an audience for Red Dwarf. Yeah, and they yeah. were very wrong, yeah. They weren't right at all. Yeah, they, well, they were, everyone knew they were wrong anyway, because how can you be, how can you be right when there's... Uh, you're getting eight and a half million viewers on BBC Two. Do you think it was about money? Um, well, it doesn't make sense. If you're the top show on BBC Two, why would it be about money? Because uh, the BBC is... Um, 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 is license, license, the license um, fees, you know, license fee, uh, it's the public pay for the BBC. And so there's no money to be made, if you know what I mean. They didn't have adverts, it wasn't a, a, it wasn't a commercial channel. Um, you know, that was, someone would have come in and said that the last person's regime is over, this is my regime. And these are the shows I want to do. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. They're not my cup of tea. And and a, and a guy in a suit can make that decision. He's making the decision for the public, not the other way around. And if it's not my cup of tea and I don't want to make it, we are no longer making Red Dwarf. Yeah, that's who you made. Yeah, absolutely. It's that, that, decision, yeah. that decision was not made by the public. Yeah. No, not or at by, all. Or by, or by falling viewing figures. That was made by a suit. Yeah. Just didn't want to make Red Dwarf anymore. Uh, that's it, yeah. Hey, that's, that's the way it goes, isn't it? Yeah, it is. The nature of the business. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, who's laughing now? Who's laughing now? <laughs> that's it. So, how did you feel when the cast reunited in 2009? Well, we'd never really gone away because we were always together at conventions or, you know, personal appearances. We 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 were constantly sort of meeting each other up in the sci-fi scene, and the, you know, so we we'd we'd always um, we'd always, you know, been living the red dwarf. It was always on repeat, you know, just because they weren't making it, they'd still be repeating. It would be on different channels. It would still be on all over the world. Remember. You know, we were going to conventions all over the world based on, on that. You know, when when they said that there was no audience, you know, my first convention was in Chicago. I've been all over the world. I've been to Japan twice. I've been to Australia four times. I've been to New Zealand. I've been to Ireland. I've been to the Czech Republic and on and on and on and on in the times when uh, people thought we were at home watching, you know, Hollyoaks with our slippers on. We were traveling around the world you're being adored by uh, Red Dwarf fans all over the world. You know, Which, so we were always, we were always together running up and down all over the world. But, you know, yeah. and so when, when, when Red Dwarf came back, i.e. was recommissioned, you know, the joke was that the UK TV is, it was 50% owned by the BBC. So we were still working on a BBC 50% owned channel, which says it all. And that channel now, this this is the last series that's going to be made on 
on, on UK TV as we know it because the BBC has bought UK TV outright. Okay. So UK TV is now owned by the same people who said that Red Dwarf doesn't have an audience. <laughs> now they own the channel that Red yeah. Dwarf is on. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, all this politricking, it's politics, I call it, politics. Yeah. How do we get Red Dwarf back without, you know, having our tail between our legs? Yeah, that's it, yeah. It's all a monopoly, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. Sure. Well, that means... It was... <laughs> Doesn't mean it won't have adverts. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know. That's something else to come. But this series, you know, you know, um, you know, it had to be made before the end of the year because at twelve o'clock at the end of the year, you know, it's not. It'll be owned by the BBC. Uh, right, and there yeah. is no, there is no guarantee that the BBC will want to make Red Dwarf. This is, I don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen after at the end of this year. Nobody knows. Those people at UK TV don't even know if they've got a job. No, everything could change turn of the year, can they? Yeah, right. As soon as we go so to, uh, yeah. Well, when when we find out who's going to be working there, then we can talk about. You know, will there be another series, or will there? Be, but until then, there's no conversation. No, and the, and like you said earlier, it depends if the uh, whoever might be in charge is a fan of that type of show, uh, your well, type of show. Yeah. So, you know, that's it. We the, we we as um, you know, after this one's done, you know, anything can happen, and you know, we'll have to wait and see. You know. Yeah. Uh, but for now. You know, the thing, the first thing is we've got a 90 minute special to film. Um, and, you know, we're out there as the face of the AA. And there's nothing more really that one could want in a show at the moment. Absolutely. Well, over me to here. here. Why do you think the BBC didn't give it that respect? Um, well, it, it goes right back to our first conversation. The first question was, in 1987, you had a show where 50% of the cast was black, yet their colour was never mentioned, has never been mentioned in 31 years. We were the most diverse show on television, without a shadow of a doubt. They should have been flying our show from the, from the highest flagpole at the BBC as a way to make television. So I don't know, I don't know what they were looking at, but I mean, yeah. it's very blatantly obvious that you can make TV shows without mentioning anything about culture or that it's is is he the best man for the job yeah those exactly. people, those people were the best actors to play those characters and history has, has proven it you know and that's it you know that that's the flagship show on television and um i'm glad i'm glad i'm in, in that show because you know, it just proves everything else is bullshit. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, so uh, just moving on from Red Dwarf, uh, Beyond Space, in 2011, you were cast as policeman Dwayne Myers in the gentle comedy drama Death in Paradise. Yeah. As, yeah, as an actor, what are the main differences between a sitcom and a comedy drama? Well, one, Death in Paradise, was never commissioned as a comedy drama. Death in Paradise was, was commissioned by drama. The same people that commissioned Sherlock. I mean, it's, that's out of the same, the same, uh, that, that show, Death in Paradise, came out of the same room as Sherlock. It was, it was classed as a, a, as a drama. That's what's so funny about it. And 
the, the reason why it was funny was because it just so happened to have two um, two actors that had done comedy and could and could could and could take the funny side out of uh, a situation, you know. But we weren't doing gags. We weren't, you know, we didn't go there to to do comedy. You know, Dwayne Myers is just a funny character. But I know loads of West Indians like Dwayne Myers. You know, um, that's just the way he speaks. You know, uh, uh, with, you know, with, with the, there's so many different uh, aspects, you know, one, the country, two, the culture, you know, the way things are done. And that's what the show was about, to show the difference between the way things were done in, say, by the British uh, guy and, and, and the Caribbean. It's a fish out of water story, you know. And yes, a lot of people say uh, a comedy, but it's not actually, it was never commissioned as a comedy. Um, yeah. So the character is just a funny guy. It's not a comedy. There's no jokes. They don't write jokes. He never does a joke. He's, he's not doing jokes. He's, he's, he's just a funny guy. Yeah, just quirky. I mean, he's a funny guy. I mean, you know, that's how West Indians talk, you know. Yeah. What they, what they, got, what they got was, you know, they just got a different rhythm of drama, you know. Because yeah. everybody's so used to having drama spoken to them like this, you see. And, you know, um, yes, um, yeah, and, and, you know, <laughs> you know, there's costume dramas, you know, the cucumber yeah. sandwiches and the parasols, and they're so used to drama sounding like this, you see. And so when you get a character who sounds like this, and then the next character is speaking like this, you go, funny. It sounds funny. <laughs> But it's not, it's just, yeah. you know, Ben Miller's character could be doing Downton Abbey. You see? It's Ben Miller's character sounded like Downton Abbey. And Dwayne's character sounded like the Caribbean. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what the show was designed to do, was, was to show that this British ass was, you know, st stuck in the Caribbean being being very British and the Caribbeans looking at him and thinking, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> he's, yeah. got a, he's got a fucking suit and tie on in 100 degrees. What the fuck? <laughs> and a briefcase. <laughs> and he's drinking tea. What the fuck is this guy talking about? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, that's why it's funny because Dwayne brings that to them in, in their face. <laughs> you know? You know, and, and Dwayne says to, to he says to the other guy, you know, when he first sees him, yeah, and he says, look, you know what, he, he's, he's not my boss, he's no boss to me, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, you know, it, 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 you know, he just didn't see that this, he thought he, whereas Dwayne, Dwayne thinks he's the one that's the fool and the stupid one. You know, Dwayne thinks, you know, Dwayne thinks that, you know, he, he respects him as a, as, as a guy who can solve crime. But he doesn't understand him. You know, and, and then he tries to lay his law down of what life is and this is how you should be, son. You know, and he, he gives it to, the, the, to, to his, uh, 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 his subordinate, he gives it to him in the neck. You know? Yeah, exactly. And that's why he says to him, you've got to be like me, the full package, JP, the full package. You know? So what is, what is perceived as, you see, it's just because Dwayne makes people laugh that it, it's perceived as a comedy drama. But if you actually look at it on paper, it actually comes under drama. But hey, it doesn't matter. For me, it's all about is the character credible? My only drive is to make that character credible. And when I say credible, I don't mean credible in the eyes of the suits. 
I mean, credible in the eyes of the people that I am portraying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because be they are the ones. They yeah. are they are the ones that you are, you know, you're telling the world these this is what these people are like or this is what this kind of guy you know, so it's those kind of people that you think mm -hmm. if they come up to you and say, Oh my god, you remind me of my uncle, which I get a lot. Man, my dad was my dad's mate was like, Oh god, he reminds me of uncle you know, that's what I get a lot of the time. You know. That, it, it reminds it reminds of someone, you know. There's no there's no greater compliment than for someone to come up and say, God, that reminds me of my uncle. Where does he live? Barbados. <laughs> you no, know, or the next person would say, Where does he live? Trinidad. Where does he live? Jamaica. Where does he live? Dominica. Where does he live? Saint Lucia. But he's not any of those people. But they remind him of a West Indian in Saint Lucia, all over the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, you know, San Marie is a fictional island. It's not Jamaica. It's not that. But those people are watching them, saying, "My God, that's just like my brother." Or, yeah, you know, yeah, that's that's yeah. the great thing, you know. And then to have the the credibility of you know the industry, that you know, when you go into Sainsbury's and you know, there's someone that the till goes, "Oh my God, yeah, shit, reminds me of my dad," you know. And then they brought. They brought his dad in, and then you see where he comes from, you know. When Ram John Holder played my father in the series, you know. Pork pie from the Desmonds. You know. So, you know, it, it, it's all about making a character credible. That's what it's about. And if everybody does their job, then those characters will be believable, and their relationships will be believable. Definitely. But, you know, that's... That's um, MO for me anyway when I walk in the door. Okay, so in 2018, you shocked Britain with your loose hips when you took part in Strictly Come Dancing. Yeah. As a former dancer, were you impressed by your own journey and what made you take part? Well, I mean, Strictly, you know, if you look at it as a TV show, you know, in the 70s, there was 20 shows like that a week on telly, you know, where a variety of artists could get on there in front of a band, in the cameras on the Saturday night, entertain the people, Sunday night at the Palladium or whatever. So, so it is the only show on television what we would refer to as a variety, what they call light entertainment. And they call it light entertainment because the society is dead, right? Yeah. Now, for me, you know, yeah. that was a natural show for me. It's been on for 15 years. I mean, I could have, you know, a lot of people, they have their agents knocking on the door strictly all the time trying to get their clients onto strictly. I'd never done that. In fact, when I got, when I was asked to do strictly, because I knew the commissioner of strictly come dancing, I've known her for years. We grew up in the same area. And, you know, I never went to her and asked to be on Strictly, you know. I can tell you that I'd met her several times at different functions, you know, before, she, before that she was at Channel 4. And uh, um, so what happened, I did a show called The Real Full Month for ITV to highlight um, prostate cancer. And it became a big, a big hit, you know. Yeah. And then I was at the Bastards of ITV for real for Monty, and then that was when the uh, commissioner came over with the producer and said, "So you're going to do Strictly this year, aren't you, for us?" And then I said, "You'll have to talk to my agent." So that's how I got on Strictly. That's how I got on Strictly. You know, I, uh, that they they I was <laughs> I was mildly told, you know, so you're going to, you know, that was it. It was just an informal, you know, uh, and then I got on it. Now. I went on Strictly, you know, to dance because, you know, anyone that knows my career, you look at my CV, you could, it's just such a natural show for me to do. Not uh, because I'm a reality star or, you know, I'm a, a YouTuber or whatever. You know, the reason I got Strictly was because, you know, 
I was just a guy that could dance. And they know me as a, a guy that does a sitcom and a, and, a, and a drama, you know, on the telly. And, you know, but then people started saying, oh, I'm too experienced to do this because I'm a trained dancer, but I'm not a trained dancer. I never went to dance school. I learned as I went along and people like Dougie Squire is pushing you, pushing you, you know? And um, mm. so, you know, Strictly was, for me, was fantastic. I, I, I mean, that's what I do. That's, it's razzmatazz, man. It's, it's jazz hands. I mean, what more could you give a, a variety performer? Yeah, so, uh, looking back at your career, what's your proudest achievement? My proudest achievement? Oh, God, there's so many. There's so many. I could, oh, I mean, that's, I mean, I mean, when you say proudest achievement to a guy who left school with no qualifications, um, with no no prospects, you know, my achievement happened the first time I got a job in the business, which was, you know, uh, in fact, my first job in the business was in 1974 while I was still at school, called a, a film called um, Seven Green Bottles. And but as a, as an as an adult, left school, you know, two years after leaving school with no qualifications, I was dancing on the end of a pier behind Jimmy Tarbuck and Dickie Henderson. Now, I could call that my, my, my greatest achievement because, you know, it was so far away from being a reality at that time that, you know, no one could really believe it. Depends what you call an achievement. I mean, I don't know. I mean, every, every time you go to another level, it's a great, it's like a greatest achievement. To get Red Dwarf, it could be my greatest achievement. To get Death in Paradise, it could be my greatest achievement. It depends what, what you had in mind. And because I didn't have anything in mind, it, 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 it's, it's weird. You know, at no point in my, in my, in my early life did I think, I'm going to be in show business. In those days, it was, shit, I've got to get a job. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's, and that's what I what did. I, I worked in a hair salon. I worked on a building site. I worked in a warehouse. I, I, I worked in a hospital. All before I got, you know, to dance on the end of a pier. So, you know, in those days, it, it, there was no sitting around waiting for show business, mate. It, yeah, there was no sitting around waiting for show business. Oh, look, my Uber man's just bought my glasses back. Isn't that funny? <laughs> just seen him. Look, that's true. You think I'm lying. You watch. Ah, oh, you know, it's funny. I just saw you drive up, man. How you doing? Oh, you okay? Do you need a drink or something, man? No, no, no. You're good? I'm fine. Nice one. Thank you, sir. Right. Nice one, mate. Uh, sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> yeah, you see? <laughs> this is how we roll. I left, I left, I, get, I went, I went to an, um, um, I went to a, 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 one of those hero award nights and I left my glasses in the back of, um, in the back of a, a, an Uber. So I yeah. got in touch with him and he said at some point that he was going to drop them off. <laughs> that's not good, that's what, see? Now, yeah. that's what you see, you, you know? A yeah. man of his word. A man yeah. of his word. Fair play. You know? Fair play. And, and there you <laughs> see it. You had it live on, live on your blog. <laughs> that's it. Uh, so, uh, finally, uh, we, the last question we've reached, and that is, what's next for Danny John Jules? Well, I'm in the middle of my one-man show tour. Whereabouts are you uh, doing that uh, tour then? Well, I've I've already done five venues. Yeah. I've done. I've, yeah, man. I was at Bognor Regis. I was in. I do. I did Manchester. I did High Wycom, uh, uh, Coventry, Durham. Yeah. So I, I kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, what's the next one? Oh, God. Swindon. Is it Swindon? No. Yeah. Something like that. Eastbourne, Swindon. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm out there doing my tour, mate. And, we're, and we, you know, as you know, we're, just, we're filming Red Dwarf, so, you know, next week we start cracking on. Yeah, yeah. 
How many uh, more and tour, yeah, tour yeah, dates yeah. do you have? Sorry. Um, I've got about another five, six, seven, seven, something like that. Yeah, all right, very good. Well, yeah, well, um, uh, I did. Did you have you? Uh, what I'll do is I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you a, a, a link to all the the the, the dates. Anyway, I mean, yeah. it's pretty much been all over social media. I mean, yeah. all my social media's got it all over it. Yeah. Yeah, but you yeah. know, again, you know, that's what I'm doing, and. I think, as you say, I mean, I've got my tour, I'm doing my tour and I'm doing Red Dwarf. I think I've got enough to, on my plate. Plus, you know, the you've got the old um, AA stuff going on, you know. So, you know. It's busy, all busy. Very, yeah. It's, it's all very, you know, I like to be busy. That's it. Yeah, that's it. No, it's nice to have it, isn't it? You know, keep on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the details of the tour and you can... Uh, yeah. Thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you liked this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates on forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time.